because they're from America. I went to school in the UK for many years. Oh, that's cool. Where do you live? Uh, I'm in New York. New York. I always want to visit New York. It's a very beautiful city. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Uh, question: Do you know about my grandma's condition? You must show this shy. Oh, oh, 奶奶，她在英国学习，所以她会说英文。是吗？<laughs> 是的。啊、uh, ，呃，宋大夫，我想问你，结婚了吗？哦、oh, ，我还没有。小伙子长得这么俊，又是大夫，还会说英语，没结婚，不会吧？ How bad is she? That you can tell me the truth. The cancer is quite advanced. Shouldn't we tell her? In her situation, most families in China would choose not to tell her. When my grandmother had cancer, my family didn't tell her. Isn't it wrong to lie? I mean, if it's for good, it's not really a lie. I mean, it's still a lie. It's a good lie. How's your grandmother? She passed away a few months after she was diagnosed. Hello, and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi, everyone. We are wrapping up summer. Ooh, it's sizzling where I am. I, I don't was, know about you. Is it still? It's cooling off here in San Diego. It's it's getting more sane. And um, I had to set up my September calendar this morning. And I was like, oh, look, the first day of fall is coming. Here we go. I love fall. Fall is my favorite. Same. Um, this week's quote unquote book and, and movie um, are going to be really fun. And we have a special guest, which is something we don't do very often. Um, but before we get to that, in case you're wondering whether this movie, if you saw the title, if it's based on a book, I'm here to tell you it's not. Here's the thing. When we went into the pandemic, we decided to do a brand new episode every single week. And that means we can't do, you know, uh, Les Miserables every week. And so we have to do shorter literary sources. So we've expanded what we mean by making quotey fingers around book um, to mean Anything that's a literary source, it could be a magazine article, it could be a song, it could be a poem, it could be a short story. In this case, it's a um, a radio essay, I guess we would call it, that was on This American Life. Um, I read the transcript, though, so that kind of counts. And yeah, we are constantly looking for suggestions. Next month is Banned Book Month, right? September. Woohoo! Yes. Um, so if you have suggestions for Banned Book Month, we are still taking those. There's a few places where you can make those suggestions, meet other listeners of this podcast, and interact with us on the internet. Yes, we have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like that. We post all the episodes there. We have a private Facebook group. That's a great place to interact with us and other listeners of the podcast. Anything that you can think of, it can be a song, it could be a radio play, it could be a magazine article, a novella. Sure, it could be a book, just not like a really long one right now, but who knows. But also the movie, the movie's really important. It has to be streaming on a major, major service. Twitter and Instagram, we're at book versus a movie. Just spell it all out. You can also reach out to us in an old fashioned way. Email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. Also, we have stickers. If you would like some stickers, send us an email and we will send them to you in the mail. And if you really enjoy the show and you would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We put up episodes there from 2020. And then previous to that, we started the show a little over eight years ago. We just posted Valley of the Dolls. We originally put that up there in March of 2020. That's a super fun one. Sparkle, Neely, Sparkle. That's a super fun one. Anyway, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and that's where you can get that bonus content. But if money is tight, we totally understand that. If you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts or just leave us a few stars, whatever, on Good Pods. We've been posting there, and people have been leaving us great reviews, and we super appreciate that. Or once again, just ask for some stickers, put it on your laptop, and show it off at the coffee shop. And let everybody know where you listen to the show. 
And before we introduce today's special guest, we want yes. to mention that this episode is sponsored by Rakuten Kobo, which is an ebook subscription service. And we want to mention a particular title, and that is um, The Unmatchmakers by Canadian Chinese romance author Jackie Lau. This one sounds so funny and a good companion to the, um, the movie that we're going to be talking about today. Yes, Jackie Lau is a very popular Asian-Canadian author. She does rom-coms. That's her whole thing. And this, The Unmatchables, is about two people who are going on vacation right outside of Toronto. And they have two mothers, Chinese mothers, that do not want to set them up. They actually want their two kids to not get together, to just have single successful lives. And so they are constantly trying to not get them to get together. So of course, they get together. And it's sexy, and it's funny. And she has a lot of really funny books out there. And she has a couple of series out there. Her name is Jackie Lau, and it is very Canadian. It's filled with butter tarts and kayaks and Tim Hortons and lots of those kind of references. If you go to Goodreads, you can read a lot about Jackie Lau. Follow her at Jackie Lau Books on Twitter and Instagram. Also, she has a site, Jackie Lau Books, and she follows the hashtag Asian Rom-Com. And if you go to Kobo right now for Canadian readers, you can get their ebook subscription for free, for free, excuse me, Kobo Plus for 30 days. Just go to our site and you can get the link there to try it out for yourself. And we want to thank them very much for supporting our show today. Yeah, the Unmatched Baker sounds absolutely hilarious. I did not yes. know that there was a thing called Canada Core, Canada Core, right? Canada, yes. I'm going to say Canada Core. <laughs> There's both. <laughs> no, not probably that too, but Canada core, like everything is core now, cottage core. Um, Auntie core. It's, yeah, there's even like a, a genre of like Amish romance. So I guess in, in, there's this romance genre that is about Canada, and I am here for it. Yes. So I'm very excited about the Unmatched Makers available now on Rakuten Kobo. Well, we have a special guest today. She was on the show, was it a couple of years ago? It was before COVID hit. And she is amazing, Kristen Meinzer, and we've become friends with her in life. And she's a big fan of the show. Welcome, Kristen, back to Book Versus Movie. Oh, my gosh. I am so pumped to be back here. Um, I know everybody who listens to your show thinks that they are your biggest fan, but I actually legitimately am your biggest fan. I... <laughs> love book versus movie. I love the wide range of uh, things you've expanded into during COVID. Uh, You know, Harper Valley PTA is one of my favorite episodes of yours based on the song, um, you know, based on magazine articles. I I love how you have really like let the show uh, grow into new places and spaces. And it's just a delight. I, I, I would not have the energy to do this show, I don't think, but you do it beautifully, both of you. Well, thank you so much. And tell them a little bit about your shows that you're yeah. on. I mean, my God, you make us look like slackers. Seriously. <laughs> well, one of the shows I host is called By the Book. And on that show, my friend Jolenta Greenberg and I choose a different self-help book in every episode. And then we, uh, down to the letter, live by the rules of that self-help book for two weeks straight while we record ourselves so you can hear how each book uh, affects our home lives, our friendships, our work, everything else in our lives, and usually um, affects our lives for the worse, not for the better. And uh, a few years back when I was on your show, we all decided to read Steve Harvey's book, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, because it, it was on my list of books to read anyway. So I'm like, we we need to talk about this because the movie that's based on it let's just all agree here the movie's better than the book oh absolutely Um, yeah oh definitely Spoiler. Spoiler. (laughs) (laughs) so i i was so lucky to be on the show with both of you to talk about that and um it it just it it scratched all of my itches my buy the book itches my book versus movie itches and so on and then i host a few other shows too i also host a show called movie therapy which we just sunsetted but margot uh, I'm sorry. We have two Margos with us right now. Right. Margo D. <laughs> <laughs> you were, Margo D, you were one of our final guests on the show. And on that show, people write in with their life issues and we prescribe movies to help people through whatever ails them, um, movies and TV shows, because sometimes the best thing we need is either an escape, a sense of perspective, or just the sense of I'm not alone in this. And a movie and TV show, they can really help with that. At least they have for me over the years. I think this movie could really help people. 
that we're going to be talking about today. Same. Ooh, I agree. Yes, 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 yes. So tell us why you picked this particular story for us to cover today. Well, I am a grandma lover. My late Nana, she was my BFF. I loved her to death. And, you know, when I reached adulthood, I no longer lived in Minnesota. I wasn't with her anymore. I was in New York. And so we had that kind of long distance relationship, uh, calling once a week or once a month, trying to stay on top of each other's stuff. And that only lasted so long, though, because she she died and it was heartbreaking and it was terrible. And this movie is a lot about that. It's about a girl, a young woman, I should say, named Billy, who is in the movie. Her name is Billy, who is, you know, trying to do storytelling. And I'm like, oh, that's what I do. I do storytelling. And I live in a different time zone than my grandmother. And um, and, and I felt like I could really relate to that. I feel like a lot of people in this day and age, whether it's, you know, an international separation or even just a time zone or a different state, that we don't, like back in the agrarian age, live generation after generation in the same town as our parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to kind of forge our own sorts of communication, our own sorts of relationships in a new and different way with loved ones. And this movie is really about that, but it's also about cultural differences. Yeah. How are things done in my grandma's town versus how are things done in my town where I live? Well, should we talk about Lulu Wang for a second? Yes. Yeah, she's fascinating. And thank you so much for introducing her to my life, I'll just say, because I've just... I am like like her new, one of her new biggest fans. She was born February twenty fifth, nineteen eighty three, in Beijing. She briefly <laughs> lived with her grandparents, Cheng Chong Shilin. Parents then moved to Miami, and so she was there when she was very little. Then she moves to Miami. She got her PhD at the University of Miami, and then decided she wanted. To, she saw the movie, The Secretary. And that's the one with Maggie Gyllenhaal. Is that right? Do, do, do y'all remember yes, that? By the way, also based on a short story. And she's also br- based in Brooklyn. Yes, yes. She decided to get into filmmaking, and she first started working as a production assistant. She worked on Pineapple Express and found out pretty quickly, this is not the life for me. I need to do something else. So she worked in basically working in production for like smaller companies, learning how to direct. Her first film was called Posthumous, and she wasn't very happy with the outcome of it. And then in real life, what happened with Lulu was that her grandmother back in China got a cancer diagnosis and she found out through her parents that she had three months to live and they said, we're going to go home and see her, but we're not going to tell her. By the way, we spoil details and this is going to be really important with this episode. If you don't want to know what happens and some people may not want to know because there's a couple of good surprises, uh, stop now. Watch the movie. <laughs> read the yeah, Then come back. Then come back. It's, it's no big deal. Story, then come yeah. back. Okay. So let's. So anyway. So Lulu's parents say, "Okay, you. We're going to go to China. You can't tell her that you know. We're, no one's going to tell her that we know. You had a cousin that married a Japanese woman, and we're and they've already been married. I think. I believe. And they're mm-hmm. just going to have a yes. party now and include the rest of the family. And they're going to. And she's just going to be a part of it. And she's not going to know that she's dying because we don't tell her that. And and then and where she is in China and they're they're part of the world." People can do that. They don't tell the person because they that could actually d- cause them to die sooner because they know. So yeah. she, and they really believe in the communal yes. uh, responsibility of we hold the grief so that the person dying doesn't have to, uh, as opposed to the more individualistic Western way of doing things. Correct. And she's she's devastated by this because she completely adores her grandmother. She spent much of her early childhood completely connected to her grandmother. They go there and nobody tells her and, and, and her mother, her father, it's funny because her father's super emotional and her mother's like kind of slapping them around, like, stop it. No crying. There is no crying during this. We're going to have a wedding. We're going to make it sure that she doesn't know. And the doctor lies to the grandmother and they do have the wedding. And I love the grandmother in this story. Like, I love how she makes fun of the Japanese wife, girlfriend, (laughs) calls her dumb. And they have the wedding. And the story is really wonderful because, and and I don't, Margo, you read it. Did you listen to it? I listened to some of it. Um, I didn't listen to it all the way through. I was listening. 
<laughs> Full disclosure, I was traveling and I was going to listen to it on the plane. And um, as we were taking off, they said, we will not, by the way, we won't be having any Wi-Fi on this uh, flight. I was like, Dang it. So I quickly got the transcript and I read the transcript on the flight, but I did listen to some of it. And she does such an amazing job of telling the story. Um, a couple of key things I just want to mention that yes. are different in the story than they are in the movie. In the in the, her real life, cousin whose wedding it is, that, that who's getting married, her cousin is already married like he's got he's been married for like a year when this has happened mm-hmm. um so it's not in the movie it, and it's much funnier to do it the way they did it in the movie that the cousin like they've just been dating for a while and they're like guess what you're getting married in the, her real life her cousin had i guess had been with this woman for some time they had been married for nearly a year and they were planning to do a celebration in china that was already in the works it was just that they shorten the timeline really fast to have a it was like the perfect excuse to do um to do what they were going to do and there was another thing that was different oh for heaven's sake that's the that's the main thing i just wanted to mention that that i know was was super different but she interviews her family and so she yes so So you hear her actual her grand you hear everybody and and i love the dog i did hear that like the thing with the dog Ellen, so sweet (laughs) ellen the dog ellen Ellen can talk ellen Ellen is the dog that they named after the exchange student. Nine Eye had an exchange student with her at one point. Nine Eye is what they call grandma. Nine Eye and um, little Nine Eye, who was grandma's little sister. And um, so it's big grandma and little grandma, Nine Eye and little Nine Eye. They have this dog named Ellen because they had an exchange student at one point from an English speaking country named Ellen. And they're like, oh, let's name the dog after that exchange student we had at one point. (laughs) And Ellen talks, Ellen the dog, the dog's Sings. Voice is very cute. Yes. And she interviews her little nine eye and she interviews all her different family members. And Lulu Wang, apparently, like she was pitching it in, in her mind and she's a typical overachiever. She's like, I'm going to pitch it to the New Yorker or This American Life. Like she has very high goals and she gets it to the This American Life, which is a very tough, by the way, if you don't know, that's those are really high places to, to pitch It's to. like, it's super hard. It's super it's hard. It's very difficult. Say. Yeah. But she yeah. does it in one take with a glass of whiskey. She gets it out. She's a great talker. In the end, spoiler, everybody, grandma lives. She <laughs> she makes it. She's like, she just keeps going and apparently still doesn't know that she had cancer or still has it. She keeps going. Well, that's the thing is that there's we don't then the whole time in both the both the this american life piece and in the movie they were like do you think she knows does she know you don't know if she knows because and there's oh this is the other thing oh finally just came back in <laughs> said this is the other thing that is not in the movie that is in the real story um which is that lulu who's the woman that you know the filmmaker that this really happened to lulu finds lulu when she's there she's you know she's an american or you know that this she's lived in or worked with it she feels she has the american point of view is what i'm saying yeah, she and she really it's i think since she was four yeah yes. and she like, feels like this toddler. is yeah. she has the american point of view like of course you have to tell her we have to tell her what how are you it's like it's almost cruel not to tell her right at a certain point she gets little nene her her grandmother's little sister and is saying like don't you think we should tell her like we should really tell her and this and the aunt explains to her like you know no and and the whole thing about like this is the way that we do things that we don't want to trouble burden people with worrying you know one way or the other and lulu finds out that her grandmother had breast cancer yeah and a, a mastectomy and i think even a double mastectomy and had hidden it from every Everybody, right. the whole the whole family did not know that she nearly died from breast cancer like nine years earlier. Um, yeah, and she and the, clear, it's not because she's ashamed; it's because she didn't want that. She didn't want to worry them exactly. Anybody else? She'll the right. idea that other people would have to worry is so crucial to the This American Life story. We don't want people to worry. Yeah, right. And so that is the moment in the in the This American Life story. That's the moment where Lulu the light bulb goes off for her. Um, that little detail is not included in the movie and it's a little bit different. Um, but I still like the way that they handle that moment. Like she still has, that character still has that moment, but it's a little different. But anyway, that's, I mean, I just, it's such a great story. Go and listen to it. If you've yeah. not listened to it, it's amazing. It's episode, I believe 585, This American Life. If you just type in Google, This American Life. Google the Farewell, life. it'll farewell. show up. It will yeah. show up. 
it's it's fantastic and it's such a fun joyous ending and she does get these this she gets some funding to write this movie and of course people are like well let's do like big fat greek wedding but we'll make a chinese version of that and she says no it's not what I'm uh gonna do. No. <laughs> no 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 i have a point of view i this is not it's a it's about lulu it's about her it's about her life being chinese american being a a single person dealing with this, losing her grandmother. That's what the story is about. And everybody, else, you know, so she, but she gets the funding for it and she films in the very location where her grandmother lived, but it's changing. You know, there's, there's big buildings building up there and hotels and stuff like that. And so she's, you know, she comes back and she's now American and she's going back to this. And then the grandmother doesn't know what they're filming there. Cause she's like, her grandmother's still living in this town and she's hiring someone to play her grandmother. And she has a $5 million budget. And the woman that she hired, Zhao Zhushen or Zhushen Chao, I know it's like in Chinese, the last name is the first name or in America, we switched that up. Anyway, she's like the biggest star in China. And she's like, why should I do your little movie? I'm used to making a lot of money. So you have really talk her <laughs> into it but they filmed in all these places and then she had really little nene she is in the movie that from the yeah, story she's a, yes. she, and she's yes. so great she's the fantastic. real little nene is playing little nene <laughs> little nene is little nene in the movie so let's do this we'll take a quick break we will play the trailer and then let's talk about this movie what's wrong dad Please tell me. Your nan is dying. She doesn't know, so you can't say anything. The family thinks it's better not to tell her. Why is that better? Chinese people have a saying. When people get cancer, they die. We have to go to China. Wedding is an excuse so everyone can see her. He's my only cousin. Do you think I should be there? You can't hide your emotions. If you go, nan will find out right away. Really? Yeah. Zala? Zabushuana 他俩在卧室能干啥呀? Shouldn't we tell her? Isn't that wrong to lie? It's a good lie. Most families in China would choose not to tell her. 你们说的啥呀? She's dying. Can you be a little more sensitive? What do you want from me? To scream and cry like you? You Okay, so this movie is released at the Sundance Film Festival in 2019. Rapturous reviews. I think it's up upwards of the 90 percentile in Rotten Tomatoes. And Lulu Wang is getting offers from all the big streaming places, but she goes with A24 instead and i'm thinking it was netflix that was throwing a lot of money at her but she didn't want to do that she really wanted to go with a production company that would put it in a movie theater because she wants to build it that way and i think that was really smart she is aquafina who's playing her and aquafina her real name is nora lum she's born in america but she's korean and chinese and american she brilliant also plays the trumpet and 
is a rapper and she, yeah, she, everything. Everything. I was thinking about her. I'm like, she does it all. She, she does it all. She's a genius yes. as well. Margaret, what did you think of this movie? This is my first time watching it. I was just. I've like, never seen it before either. I, I didn't want it to end. Right. I just want to say before we go any further that I have little Nai Nai style goals now. <laughs> like her whole look you need that perm i i want the perm i want the i want the bedazzled cap i need the colorful like long sweatshirt dresses i'm i christmas future ladies and gentlemen for me i love it i mean i think the whole way that it opens where she's the whole thing the whole way that the story is told is so new. I mean, it's just like a way we haven't seen a story told in this way before. There were a lot of ways that you could one could have approached this story could have started it could have ended it. Um, I really love the 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 opening of the movie, I think is so brilliant that you have Aquafina, she's walking down the street in New York City, she's talking to she's talking in Chinese to her grandmother. So it starts with in Chinese. So she's talking in Chinese to her grandmother on the phone. And I, but you can see she's in New York City, clearly. And she bumps into somebody and and has a quick exchange with them in, in English, and then goes back to Chinese. And so you get all of it, like you get this whole story of her right away, um, in just a few seconds of, of film without giving the like, we moved far away when I, you know, it, it doesn't even go that like you get it, you get it. And, you know, you have a character who is a, a millennial, I think we can say, right? She's a millennial and she is struggling. Like millennials are struggling right now. And the fact that we see right on early on that she is even applying, just like you were talking about, like with Lulu Wayne going, well, should I go with the New Yorker or should I go <laughs> with this American life? Why not? Uh, the fact that the character of Billy is like even applying for a Guggenheim grant tells us a lot about her right so she's super super smart she's not a slacker she obviously has worked very hard um but like for a lot of millennials things are really screwed up for them and so they don't you know they're really struggling and you see her struggling with her rent you see her parents are disappointed but i love this the setting of the scene right from the beginning of these you know these two parts of her identity because it is really just a really a lot about her and and you, right away you get how important her grandmother is to her. The, the little exchange, just simple, ordinary exchange. Are you wearing a hat? You know, oh, hey, hey, what's that noise in the background, Grandma? You know, all of that stuff I think tells us so, so much. Um, the cast is spectacular. We, I think we need to – let's talk about this cast. I, I have to point out Aquafina did win a Golden Globe for this for Best Acting. Um and in my opinion, well deserved. Yeah. And and so surprising because I think up until this point, a lot of people saw her for her comedy, for her over the top roles, for being very wacky, for being oftentimes profane and in your face. And I think this role, she was really able to show off her subtleties, just her eyes or her eyebrows or her posture. Yeah. It's so much in certain scenes where she wouldn't even say a word and I would just start crying because she was so good she would relay so much like i am trying to be jolly here or i am trying to be strong and you could see behind it all she is just crumpling she is falling apart inside and i just feel like that's such a not just a surprise for aquafina but for any actor that's a hard you know line to walk it's a lot of physical uh like you said without saying it in words i mean she's staying in this like she's broke she's on there on credit cards staying in a crappy hotel where it's like a, a hotel notel like motel notel sort of thing where men bring <laughs> sex workers to party with and she's got a and she's staying there and and alone at night and thinking about what do i go home to and what is grandma going through do i say so how do i act jolly when I'm in such a f in state of flux, like when she probably wants to talk about a lot of things, but she doesn't want to scare her or make her. She also doesn't want to make her grandma nervous or uncomfortable or worry about her. It's also that. So she's trying to, you know, put on a happy face for her as well. And then you know, it's also like she's you see her and I, re I was reading some interviews like she's very stooped over sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's just like very. all the things that she's just trying to deal with with her family. I love the relationship with her mother. Yes. Her mother is yeah. like the strongest person in all that group because her dad and her uncle and her cousin and all the men 
<laughs> are, are falling apart. Mom. Yeah? I want to stay in China. And I'll take care of Nai Nai. What? You stay here to do what? You can cook, you can clean. Oh, she's here. I'll figure it out, Mom. So you just stay here and what? Wait for her to die? What about the fellowship? Just forget about it, huh? And you're 30 years old. You just stop your life and stay here. And every day she have to look at you with that sad looking face. That's not nice for anybody, right? You know, one of the few good memories of my childhood were those summers at Nine Eyes. They had that garden. Yeah, yeah, and I would catch dragonflies. And then we just moved to the States. Everything was different. Everyone was gone. It was just the three of us. And it was hard. It was hard for us, too. I wanted to believe that it was a good thing. But all I saw was fear in your eyes. And I was confused and scared constantly because you never told me what was going on. And then Yeah Yeah died. You didn't even tell me he was sick. So it felt like he just vanished suddenly. And you wouldn't even let me go to his funeral. You were at school. We didn't want you to miss the school. We did what we thought was best for you. But I never saw him again. <laughs> and every time I came back to China, he just, he just wasn't there anymore. <laughs> and I come back and he's just gone. The house is gone, Adia is gone, our Beijing home is gone, and soon she'll be gone too. And her mother, the women are very, very like steel magnolias, like extremely strong, very determined. And her mother is just keeping it together. And I loved the story about... And I didn't know this, that in China, people hire people sometimes like it's how much you cry at a funeral shows how respect for the dead. And her mother was like, that's uh, that's BS. I'm not doing that. Like and, and then, then there's that scene where they this person hired criers for their funeral. And her mother was like the Eastern versus the Western way of living. And then you come to America and you live here for 30 years. Of course, things are going to, you're going to look at things differently and you're going to adapt to some things. And I, I just thought she was so good. I thought her parents were really amazing. Yeah. One thing I want to say about the mom character, Diana Lynn plays her. Mm -hmm. One thing I really like about her is you get to see nine eye through different eyes because you know, Aquafina is playing Billy, the granddaughter, the precious one. She loves grandma so much. Grandma can do no wrong. But her mom is the daughter-in-law. And maybe her mom doesn't see Nai Nai as perfect. Maybe she's a little irritated with Nai Nai at times. Maybe she's a little bit irritated with the way the old country does things. And I like that there's that conflict there. Mm -hmm. um, because it is different to be the daughter-in-law than to be the granddaughter. And yeah. I think when I was a little kid idolizing my Nana, I didn't really understand all that. I'm like, as an adult, I get it now. I'm married and I am a daughter-in-law. I get it. But yeah. back then, you know, back in the day when I was essentially the Billy and I had my Nana, I'm like, no, how would anybody think my Nana is anything less than the greatest person who ever lived? Right. And yeah, it's different though when you're the daughter-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we also see her through the eyes of little Nana. Yes. And, and her sons. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I love that we have this character of the Nai Nai character is, of course, it's is the, what did they call that? The pivotal, the you know, the thing on which everything spins in the story, even oh, though yeah. the story is about Billy, it's, you know, it really is about Billy, but it all the whole plot spins around Nai Nai. So you have this, you know, as this, as the movie goes on, we learn that Nai Nai has, Nai Nai has lived through a lot. She was in the army. 
apparently, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And she, um, you know, she lost her husband also to, I think it sounded like also to cancer. cancer. And, um, you know, and she's, she, she was separated by thousands and thousands of miles from both, from all of her children. You know, none of her children lived with her for 25 years and she didn't have them around. So she's obviously a very, very strong woman. And she raised her granddaughter for, you know, a good chunk of time. And yeah, to see all these different people's perspectives on her, including her old like army, army buddies, <laughs> you know, at the way we're at the wedding and like trading old army stories. Um, I Yeah, I, I love that, that you and you sort of see that like what I came away with it. And, and it's a, you know, you have a lot of contrast of the different stages of life you have. You, have, of course, have Billy. Billy's who's about 30 ish, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think. And then you have some younger people like she's got her younger her younger um, members of the family, like that little boy that, who, that they're going to send to the U.S. to go to school. Then you have the parents, of course. And then you have, you know, Nina and her generation. And I came away with, you know, when you, the scenes, especially where you have Nai Nai at home with little Nai Nai and that man, Mr. Lee, that lives with them for some reason. And they're made, they have a maid, especially in the, in the U.S. because we have such a youth oriented culture. You know, it's so everything is just aimed at mm-hmm. under the under 35s. And the fact of the matter is like Nai Nai is like the best possible outcome. Like if we're lucky, we will get to be that. We will get to be the, the you know, again, like this, I, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, bedazzled hat, perm. <laughs> um, that is, those are my goals. And, but I mean, seriously, like if you're lucky, that is what we get to do. And um, yeah, have good friends. Yeah. Your Living sister's right nearby. That's the best yeah. possible thing and, that can happen. She- and she's still very headstrong and has her wits about her. She has strong opinions. Sometimes she's a little bit bitchy, you know. You know, as as you already mentioned, you know, maybe she thinks her grandson is marrying a dum dum, um, <laughs> and she says that out loud. <laughs> she's not always a hundred percent sweetness and light, um, but she has a rich life and she does a lot of different things. She still works out every day, you know, things like that. <laughs> and, and and she believes that life is about how you go about doing things. It's not about the destination. She shares wisdom with Billy about that. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, do you get the Guggenheim? Do you end up with this job? Do you end up accomplishing this goal? Well, I don't know if that's as important as what you do along the way. That's kind of what Nai Nai says to Billy. I love the wedding scenes. I love any kind of a wedding scene. I just, you know, they're, they're built to be a horrifying experience. Like if people just kind of band <laughs> together to make it better. And I love it. Like the family is singing along and they're having a good time. And then the Japanese couple, they're singing a Japanese song and it's very stiff and it's sort of like that transition. And then they go back to the drinking games and that poor guy is trying to keep up with the drinking and he's just crying because he's so like sick from the alcohol. And they're just, it's the, the camaraderie that they have as this family is they have so much fun together in the midst of everything that's going on. On. It's it's really heartwarming. it's really it really, is it's really it, is. it's very funny at times but also just like it it got my blood pressure up so much that whole wedding because yeah on the one hand it's like oh this is like such a spectacle and it's so fun and the camera is spinning and spinning and spinning and people are giving speeches but at the same time tears are rolling down their faces and they're trying so hard not right. to just be like and I, and I, this is the last time I'll ever see you. I love you. Wow. Thank you for everything. But then they're kind of like letting bits and pieces of that out accidentally. They're accidentally saying out loud what they're not supposed to say out loud about 
why they're there really right. is Nainai. It's not about this fake wedding. In the original piece, the uncle does cry and mm-hmm. says, like, oh, you're the best mother ever. And you could hear that. And the poor man is just like, just, just wasted just can't even you know hold it together that's why it's so amazing like in the end well there's a scene where where she works out every day and she's telling billy nine is like you know she's doing her little exercises like this is how you get out the toxins you know ah you know push out <laughs> things and which and then when she comes back to america and they they leave and they don't know and they, they fake the um the the hospital report to say benign something or other yeah. So in the in the movie, so as we said in the radio piece, Lulu Wang's kind of light bulb moment is when she learns that her grandmother has hidden her breast cancer from everybody for nearly a decade. In the movie, and I love the way they do this in the movie. In the movie, everybody's at the wedding, and we're like, it's I, and you get this sense as the evening is going on with the drinking and everything that the whole family's like, we're actually doing it. We're actually getting away with this. Oh my gosh, it's actually, <laughs> hey, it's actually working like we thought it was going to work. This is awesome. And they're all posing for the photos. And the aunt's like, oh, yeah, take a look at my camera. Where's my camera? And Nine says, oh, it's in my purse. Uh, oh, okay, well, where's your purse? Oh, I sent our maid with it to go pick up my test results because you didn't pick them up earlier. So I sent her. And the whole family's like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> and Billy, you see Billy. I love the scene where Billy is just running. She's running and running. And, like, she has every – again, it's such a great performance by Aquafina because – She's running down the street. There is no dialogue. And yet you see like all of the emotions, everything is coming to a head. And she is just running like she's just racing with the devil to get to the hospital to get the results in time. And and breaks she does manage down sometimes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ugh. Like, ugh. Yes. And then starts again. <laughs> yeah. And and she does. She makes it in time. And they um, which they did do in the story that they faked her test results before showing them to the grandmother. But I love the kind of dramatic time crunch way that they do it. Like it's the day of the wedding and they're they're in the Kinkos in China, basically. And the guy's like fixing the, the document like, OK, I guess we're doing this now. But that for her is the moment for Aquafina's character of uh, Billy, where she is, has her light bulb moment and is like, okay, I'm, I am part of this. It's like, I am, I am. Yeah. Okay. We're doing this. And from then on out, she's, she's helping this whole thing go along. That scene, like after they show her the test results and the grandmother's like, see, I told you. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) is so awesome. And I love, I love the end of this movie. I think it's so beautiful. I I was, because I was thinking, because I had read the story, um, and I know in the story it's like, da-da-da-da, and she's still with us, and, you know, it, she keeps, they keep telling her she has cancer and she keeps living, basically is the end of the This American Life story. But as I was watching the movie and I was enjoying it so much, I started thinking, well, how are they going to end this? Like, where do you, how yeah. do you... Mm-hmm. And like, where do you, in the, how do you in this story, do where do we kind of like put our pencils down? Um, and I think the way that they did it was, was absolutely unexpected and perfect for me anyway. Yeah, same. I, they have, and I know that spot. I know if you, Kristen, know that spot too. I think you'd Margo too. I think it's in Times Square, like where she's like walking, she's back in New York. Yeah. And then she just goes, ah, out of nowhere. And in New York, you could do that and nobody would even look twice. They're kind of like, oh, right. yeah. You, you could moment. roll around on the ground yeah. and like eat grass in New York and nobody would care. It's one of those but, great things about New York. Like people will let you have a good cry by yourself and like give you your space oh, yeah. in a way. Yeah. And then we see grandma just doing her little exercises in her apartment. And I just like my the joy I felt watching that just really made my heart just kind of burst I was just like this is so perfect and apparently at Sundance in the audience people just burst into tears as soon as they saw the real Nene I would yeah I I have to say um uh this movie just watching the trailer again in preparation for this before I even watched the movie Mm -hmm. even that had me sobbing just the trailer alone I was like oh my god and um uh, unlike you guys, the order I watched all of this in or consumed all of this in was a friend first posted the trailer when the movie was going to come out. I watched the trailer. I sobbed. 
Then I went to the movie theater. Back when, um, I don't know if you remember MoviePass, but MoviePass still existed back then. Yes, you I know, do. You pay like $8 a month and watch 800 movies in the theater a month or whatever. Um, and, um, and I saw it multiple times in the theater. Really? And then it was only much later that I ever listened to the This American Life story. Wow. So I did it the other way around. And so um, I, I don't know if that affected where or when my tears came, but the movie still makes me cry and the trailer still makes me cry. But um, the radio story is so beautiful, but um, it doesn't elicit the same thing in me for some reason. It's just I could see that. Yeah. And I can see too how this movie is, it's, it is definitely, I'm glad you said that because one of these, this is one of those movies that bears multiple viewings because mm. there are so many details, like just Billy's apartment alone. There's so much to see in her apartment. So many little things, little clues to her character and who she is. Um, plus like Nai's apartment. I, I mean, I just love Nai's apartment. I could watch that over and over again. Oh, I forgot to mention. There's a mention kind of at some point where they're all having di- – they're all these like interesting family dinners where – the family is like kind of poking at each other. It happens multiple times. They're digging at each other um, while they're also, you know, I guess it's like, it's of course, it's super stressful what they're doing, what they're going through is, is really extremely stressful. And so it makes sense that you're going to take it out on each other a little bit, you know, here and there. At one point, they tell a story about how Billy, and this was true of Lulu Wang also, how Billy really played the piano when she was a little girl and that she was a great pianist. And anyway, later on, when the family's really, the stress is really coming to her head, the family's really arguing with each other, she sits down and plays the piano. And I got, I'm wondering if that was Lulu Wang really playing. I don't know. I couldn't find anywhere where it said who was actually playing. But that, you know, it's so, it was such a great moment to me because she is she's watching the family like take these jabs at each other she's grieving her you know her she's coming to terms that she's losing her grandmother um she's also coming to terms of what she's lost in her family leaving china mm-hmm. you know she's she's realizing like we've missed out on a lot she doesn't have she can't express any of that out loud because she's not allowed and so what does she do she sits down at the piano and she expresses it that way and at first the family kind of just keeps going and they keep talking and they're just ignoring her but eventually they can't they have to stop and and listen they can't ignore her anymore i thought that moment was very very moving and that's not in the in the original story at all maybe it happened maybe it didn't um but it's a great movie moment for sure yeah, the original yeah. story is uh, the radio play is like maybe 20, 22 minutes at most. So, yeah, there's only so much you can do. Also, with the movie, there's a bird theme. There's a bird that flies in and out of a room, which mm-hmm. is the, that's a whole thing that's going on there. Music is a really big indicator of different scenes and how it's used. Language is very interesting how it's used because sometimes people speak English, sometimes they're speaking Mandarin. There's the, the fiancé that or wife who can speak Japanese but nothing else so sometimes it's just how language is used the doctor can speak English but uh, he went to the UK not the USA I mean it's just there's different things <laughs> that people can say and how they say it and I I really enjoyed it it was, was, was really very life affirming and it's um, yeah. I and, and I do like that we get a lot more in the movie of the different dynamics I mean the mm-hmm. story the original source material uh, we get bits and pieces but not really the full glimpse of like Lulu Wang's dad, or I should say Billy's dad in the movie, versus Billy's uncle. Like, Billy's dad was the smart one. Billy's uncle mm-hmm. was the one who was maybe a better son and more loyal, but he wasn't the favorite. And how does that play out in a family dynamic when mom's dying? Um, uh, and, and, and just, you know, all of those different connections and disconnections because you see that constantly happening in the movie the connections the disconnections uh the things people are keeping secret and the things people are saying out loud those are constantly there in every scene the frustrations and the baggage we have with our families because uh i think one thing that movies don't always show is um, or books for that matter when somebody dies it's not like usually everybody just unifies, gathers around and feels what they need to feel. Oftentimes there's a lot of resentment. There's a lot of guilt. There is anger at other members of the family. It's not just like, this is the magic moment where we we go around your 
deathbed and we hold your hand and we all cry together. No, there's no. a lot more going on and what's being said or not said. We get glimpses of all of that with all the family members in this movie. Yeah. Grief is a very messed up thing and it, it affects people very differently. And it's what do they say now? It's something you work through. You don't work around it. It affects people very differently. You can yeah. see that here. Oh, well, one thing I just want to add, though, about this movie, because I think maybe I've made the mistake of making it sound like it's a huge downer because I kept mentioning that I cried and grief and death. It's actually super funny. This movie that's is- true. You're, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we are kind of talking about it that way. You're right. <laughs> It is. You will laugh. You will totally laugh. There are so many funny moments and and so many funny moments in like the saddest moments also, yeah. like in all the saddest, saddest scenes when they're st- when they're in the, the whole family's in the hospital and the doctor is lying to the grandmother. Right. And she Billy is confronting him in English and he's answering her truthfully in English. And the grandmother is sitting there oblivious to what they're saying. Um, yeah, it's funny, but it's also like, it's so heartbreaking, but it's also funny. It, you will laugh. Yeah. The movie, I, I think the movie poster does a really good job of capturing like, oh, something is like, you know, so it looks celebratory, but completely stilted and off. If you look at the movie poster, it's like something's not right here. And it's kind of funny, but maybe solemn. And I think, yeah, that that's how the whole movie is to me. It's got a little bit of everything. So book versus movie. <laughs> I say the movie. <laughs> oh yeah, totally the movie. <laughs> yeah, I have to say the movie too, but I I do want to just reiterate it might be because I watched the movie first. And sometimes when we I, I find it for myself, sometimes the thing I consume first is what I like better. Yeah. Um so maybe I just didn't give the radio story a fair shot because I did the movie so many times first for the rape story. Well, I think I don't know. Aquafina, uh, the whole the cast is so awesome. Um, the, the and just is her dad. I love him too. Yeah. I love him too. And I think just like Kristen, like you were saying that the the um, the fact that you have this phenomenal cast gives us more of the the it really really bring you know, this sounds so stupid really brings the characters to life to have them played by <laughs> live people um but <laughs> but there is a difference between hearing somebody talk about her dad and seeing her talking to her dad yeah. um and yeah. seeing the both sides of that conversation and um and you want to have both sides of that conversation you hear the story and you want to know like what was the dad thinking what was the dad going through what was that like for the daughter she you know his wife who's the daughter-in-law maybe she, this isn't her favorite person on earth and here she's going along with this whole fake wedding thing um so yeah i think and and it's just yeah it's so well written the movie is so well written mm-hmm. the way that the this story in somebody else's hands could have been so schlocky right. and so heavy handed and so like playing the violins for the wrong reasons. But it's it, the, the way that the story is told, the way it's kind of parsed out to us is so engaging and so funny and very, very fresh and just a completely different way than what we're used to. And I, I absolutely love it. Well, like I said, yeah. like a lot of people pitched it to her, like my big fat Greek wedding, but we'll make it Chinese. I like my big fat Greek wedding. It's it's perfect for what it is. I mean, but this is not what this is. This is a whole other thing. I also forgot to mention how hungry did this movie make you? How much did you want? Oh my to- gosh, oh, the, the food, food. all Every the food. Was sitting around Nine Eyes dinner table to I, the actual wedding banquet itself. Those beef Everything. patties, things that she was yes. making. I- oh. I was already when when Aquafina is at her mom's house doing laundry, and the mom's like, "How many wontons do you want?" I'm like, "Wontons, like a dozen, like yeah. <laughs> please, yes, ma'am. I'll do all your laundry for free." Yes. Um. One other thing I want to just say about this movie is I tend to think that um, there is a higher success rate with adaptations of short source materials than big source materials. Uh. When the source material is really long, I feel like a lot of filmmakers feel like, oh, I have to cram as many details in here as I can. Um, I want to make sure I'm not upsetting any of the people who love the Lord of the Rings. So I'm going to have every single sentence from this book in this movie. No, it's not going to be one movie. It's going to be eight. You know, they just really try to cram too much in. Harry Potter and uh, Lord of the Rings, I think, both do that. Um, But there's something like really special about 
short source materials where you can build on that world, where you don't have to just photocopy what is on each page. And it's done so well here. It's done so well in um, a lot of the other uh, stories that you've discussed on the show. Uh, and, and I just think, you know, Shawshank Redemption, for example, oh my God, or right. Stand By Me, or Secretary, which we already mentioned. It, when you have a short uh, source material, you can just broaden out the universe and get more nuanced in it, yeah. rather than just feeling like I have to photocopy every word for the people who are loyal to the book. And uh, and, and it's just done so beautifully here, just expanding it, not trying to photocopy the source material. She's just she's a creator that I'm really interested in now. I, I really want to know what else she's going to be into, what she else she wants to do, what other stories she has to tell. And she's her partner is Barry Jenkins from Moonlight. So, oh really? I know. I didn't know that. What a powerhouse team! I mean, oh how first of all, yeah, how good looking are they? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and talented. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. And she went to Boston College, Margo. She did. I went to Boston University. Oh, that's right. Um, which was down the street. I almost went to Boston College. Yeah. Um, we forgot. Yeah, we didn't mention how very, very pretty Lulu Wang is. She's super she, pretty. She's stunning. <laughs> yes. Um, Aquafina is very, very beautiful. But if you look at a picture of them side by side, it just looks like two movie stars. Yeah. It, seriously, you'd be like, well, who's starring in this film? Right. Yes. It would be hard to tell. And the same thing, actually, with the woman who plays the mom. What's her name again? Diane. Um, what's... Oh, uh, Diana Lynn. Diana Lynn, who's very glamorous and beautiful. But in the movie, mm -hmm. she's she's very much like American mom mom. down. <laughs> yeah. Like a suburban mom. Yeah. No uh, but she's a gorgeous a woman. She's <laughs> really beautiful and glamorous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely movie. Yep. No question. Movie we all agree. Yep, movie it is. Movie for it sure. Is. Awesome story. Definitely listen to it. But, oh, I want to watch it again, like, right now. I know, I know, I know. This is going to be one of my go-tos. <laughs> Can we all just get together, order about 80 pounds of Chinese takeaway, oh. and watch this movie together again? Please. Please. Let's do it. It's a date. Now, what are we doing next? Because it's September. Yeah, we're going to do BAM Book Month. Um, I was just saying, like, maybe we should just take next week off just because it's Labor Day and all that. Okay. Yeah. But, like, what's... Oh, that's right. It's... Yep. So, so it is. I think, like, why don't we start with the Chocolate War? Because... Oh, it's yay. Kate Bush summer. This is, it's, it's Kate Bush Summer. It's a Kate Bush Summer. Um, yeah, I haven't read that in ages, and I love that movie. I love that movie. I love that book. And then we'll figure I'm out. I'm ready for some Yaz. Yeah, Yazoo. I'm, I'm totally into it. <laughs> and I remember that story, like, maybe really messed me up when I was a kid. We have a big list, unfortunately, of banned books to choose from. It's growing. It's growing. That's what we have to do. And then October, it's scary books. Um, we have Disney in December, but you guys, please. Think about those options and story ideas and bo books and movies you think we should cover. Uh, Kristen, once again, please uh, let our audience know where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, well, you can always find more of me at KristenMinzer.com. On Twitter, I'm at Kristen Minzer. On Instagram, I'm at K10Minzer, K10Minzer. And uh, just one other show I want to shout out that I forgot to mention earlier I also co-host a show called Romance Road Test, which is exclusively on Audible. Ooh. And um, you should already have an Audible membership, by the way, so you can listen to all the great books that the Margos here discuss on the show. Yeah. Uh, I love listening to audiobooks. But um, my show, Romance Road Test, it's kind of like by the book. Jolenta, uh, my co-host from By the Book, she and I just live by different relationship hacks with our husbands. We do things like reenact our first dates. We do things that are terrifying. We assemble flat pack furniture. We do loads of other things to see if uh, they help us to feel closer or uh, hate each other. Uh, and, and indeed, there are some things that do not go well. There are moments where my husband, Dean, and I are not at our best with each other during that show. So check it out if you want to hear people uh, falling in love all over again and fighting also. I listen, Romance Road Test. Romance Road Test on Audible. I listened to the first episode where you all recreate your first date and I loved it. I thought it was really... Oh, thank you. I haven't heard it at thank all. Yeah. I have to go check this out because I've been oh. married for like 800 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. And maybe after you listen to all 15 episodes, maybe you'll 
think, oh, I'll try this one, and I will never try that one. <laughs> Margo, where can they find you? <laughs> you can find me online at coloniabook.com, and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at Brooklyn Fit Chick on Twitter and Instagram. My site is brooklynfitchick.com. I'm at Margot Donnie on TikTok. And my book is coming out in October, filmed in Brooklyn. And both Kristen and Margot are in my book. You're both quoted in my book. Yay! I'm thrilled about that. So thank you both so much for that. We will be back soon with a new episode. And uh, keep reading. Keep cool. Uh, keep reading, babe. That's all I can say. <laughs> keep reading. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book vs. Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.